maybe we'll have to have some testimonies afterwards. But uh, uh, I've said that before to my wife, and she said, oh, somehow you make it last. And uh, I don't know if she's being facetious, hypocritical, or whatever that is, but uh, uh, the word, there's always a great amount of truth in God's word. Uh, as we've mentioned, we've got this annual meeting coming up fairly soon, and uh, that's just around the corner. So we're making plans on camp. And uh, so uh, we've already, got, Linda, we got some dates uh, set for camp yet? We don't have some dates set for camp yet, so they'll be finalized at that meeting. So uh, if you're going to be here and working with camp and helping with camp, uh, uh, please talk to Linda and myself and uh, uh, so that we can get a plan for camp and the dates of camp this year. And uh, we want to do, do that in such a way that it works the best for the most people. Uh, so uh, uh, that kind of camp is usually in the uh, first or second week in, uh, in uh, July, and it will be probably that way year again this year. But uh, uh, get your two cents worth in, if you can get your two cents worth in to help us to make those plans. And um, uh, anything else that you want brought up at the meeting that is uh, uh, going to require a vote or something, I encourage you to speak to myself or speak to the deacons so that uh, we could get something on the agenda. Um, and uh, I do not like to be surprised at business meetings with the new things brought from the floor, especially if it involves some thinking, because I don't think so good. So I got to have a little bit of time to think. And so if it's something new, uh, we would like to talk about it ahead of time, or maybe I'll need to talk it to, about, to the deacons about it as well. So just some things to be thinking about. Um, Linda, do you have anything else about the business meeting, about the annual meeting? I think I was talking to you and I might have forgot it. So she forgot it already too. So I, we're on the same page there, so we're both forgetting. But uh, again, that annual meeting is an important one and it uh, kind of gets us on the right uh, plan for the year. So uh, we're gonna open our Bibles tonight, the book of First Corinthians, the First Corinthians and uh, we're going to be going to chapter 15 tonight. I have a relatively short passage of scripture, and uh, I've had a couple of short ones on Wednesday nights, and some of you have been rejoicing and got out of here a little bit early, and I just want to say thank you. I'm glad I made you happy, and uh, uh, I'm hoping I can make you happy again here tonight. I was just talking to Brother Burroughs, and it sounds like he's going to be gone uh, next weekend. He's not going to make it out to any of the services uh, is that right? You got you got meetings coming up. And, yep, yep. So uh, I wish him well and journey mercies as he goes. Keep him in your prayers. He does a lot of driving, and uh, uh, to uh, fulfill the role, the mission that God has called him to. So pray for safety for him. And, and we're kind of finishing off First uh, Corinthians 15 here tonight. And uh, uh, I. Uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 15 has always been known as the resurrection chapter at, uh, and uh, um, uh, the summary of the gospel comes forward and some of the other things. But uh, uh, we're looking in 1 Corinthians 15 beginning in verse number 51 and we're kind of closing this chapter out. And uh, uh, 1 Corinthians uh, is a great uh, New Testament book. It really covers a lot of subjects that uh, a lot of the things in the early church really are based upon uh, the the formation of the new churches and uh, uh, a lot of things set in order from uh, the book of First Corinthians and our, our our text today is dealing with uh, uh, the the mystery of the resurrection the uh, some of the truths regarding the resurrection we've already visited some of those already but uh, uh, Paul now uh, is speaking here and uh, he's quite uh, clear when he begins this uh, he said I'm going to read the whole text here beginning 51 through down. Uh, 58 then we'll kind of break it up here a little bit and um, and so he says behold I show you a mystery we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump for the trump shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immort uh, immortality shall be brought to pass 
that saying which is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of the sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And uh, let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. And uh, Lord, please loosen this stammering tongue and to speak with clarity and truth. And may we see great truths here. If there's some here that... Uh, uh, that need to rehear this and just to reaffirm the truths of your plan for the future. I pray that this message would speak to their heart and show them that that you've given us the answers and it's right here in your book. And uh, I pray that your word would speak to hearts, give us this hope, giving us encouragement and, and uh, sharing with us the truth. Now bless us as your word goes forth and we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, First Corinthians uh, is a great book. Uh, I can remember when I started the ministry preaching through it. It's a, it's a lot of verses. It's 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 a lot of verses. We're at the end. Fifty one verses are are going to wind this down here. Uh, a matter of okay, fifty eight. Uh, it, it starts at fifty one, ends on fifty eight, takes the end of the chapters. Not very many chapters in the scripture that have fifty eight verses in them. It's a it's a rather long chapter in the New Testament. It's Paul's writing to the church in Corinth, and uh, the church in Corinth needed to. Uh, needed to understand some teachings, and uh, not the least of which are the many things that are addressed in 1 Corinthians 15. There's a, there's a problem sometimes in the church when it comes to the understanding of things to come. And 1 Corinthians is a great book to go to to clarify some of the things that there, there's a lot of mis, uh, wrong teaching about some of the things. So we go through this slowly, and Paul really unveils it really clearly. So there is no real uh, no no argument about the things said here. So we see that first the promise of Paul. Behold, I'll show you uh, show you a great mystery. Verse fifty one, and we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And the we, of course, here is speaking of the children of God. And the word sleep is speaking about dying, the physical death. It says uh, this: he's, We shall not all uh, die uh, sleep. Uh, but we shall all be changed. And, uh, uh, and there's that promise, and uh, uh, we shall not all die, but all, all shall all be changed. Now, uh, it's kind of interesting he writes this because he's writing it way back then, and we need to write that today. Because, uh, uh, quite frankly, the, some of the things we're talking about here are, are, could reach fulfillment in my lifetime and in your lifetime. And some of the most, everything, he's, a lot of the things he's talking about here are prophetic. They're reaching into the future. So he said, I show you a great mystery. And uh, he says, we, meaning the children of God, shall not all sleep physically before the resurrection day. Now, uh, the people in his day they are all dead. They're all gone. But we're here, and uh, the day of resurrection uh, is, uh, is coming, and it's closer today than it was just uh, some years ago. And uh, the we here is referring to the saved, and he talks about what's going to take a place on that day in uh, verse 51. Uh, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And so that's one of the things that takes place is there, there's going to be a change that's going to take place in the coming future. And, uh, and he talks about what that change is like. And uh, first we can notice the speed of time that at the minute the change is going to take place. It's going to be in a moment, in a moment. And, uh, and um, he even t exemplifies that further in the twinkling of an eye. Now, I'm, I'm not, um, uh, I'm not uh, an expert in medicine, but the twinkling of an eye sounds like a very short time, doesn't it? That's just a, a minute, uh, yeah, a very short, short, short period of time. Amen? Yes, Dick. Now we got it straightened out. <laughs> Eleven one hundredths of a second. So, and uh, and uh, and he says, uh, he says, in the twinkling of the eye, at the last trump, for the trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So, uh, we're looking forward to that uh, resurrection day, 
And uh, someone said, well, when is it going to come? Has it already come? It hasn't already come. Uh, when is it going to come? Well, uh, uh, Pastor uh, Burroughs has been in the ministry longer than I. When is it going to come, brother? No one knows but the Father in heaven. That's right. And by the way, that's a quote from Scripture, too. No one knows but the Father. Uh, that's a quote. He's quoting it correctly. And so, uh, so no matter how long a person, and by the way, if you're sitting under somebody that says they know the time, go find somebody else to sit under. Because uh, most of the people that are saying that sort of stuff are wackos. Uh, and uh, on the television, the different ministries, no one knows the time. It's, it's between the Father and the Son. It is. It's between the Father and Son. And, uh, uh, and so uh, I show you a mystery. We, the children of God, shall not all sleep uh, before that resurrection day. So now, uh, first we see here, uh, shall not all physically sleep. And that word, and I have it in your outline there, it's speaking about physical death. Uh, uh, sleeping uh, in the scriptures oftentimes is referred to uh, the resting until the resurrection. And uh, that's what it's used for uh, metaphorically here, before the resurrection day. And uh, the we here uh, is, of course, is referring to the children of God. We shall not all sleep. We shall all not physically die before the resurrection day comes. And, uh, uh, and that's what he's saying. And there, for on that day, uh, we shall all be changed. Now, that's, that's, a, that's a, a good... Uh, for You know, the thing I uh, enjoy the most about this, remember who Paul is talking to. He's talking about people in that day and how many days have gone on and he's saying the same words speak to us today. And so there's, that's uh, how we have to take these things metaphorically and, and as, as an actual thing, meaning for us. If it applied to them, how much more does it apply to us all these years have gone by? Uh, we're that much, we're a lot closer in our day than he was in that day. And yet he presented it as something that could happen at any moment. Now, can anybody think of a reason why he would want people to view that as something that could be? Well, I can, t I can think of one. He wants us to be alert. He wants us not to rest on our laurels, to, to live like each day could be our last. You know, the best Christian is one that thinks the resurrection could happen at any moment? Amen? Why? Because they're on guard. They're working harder. They're doing uh, a better job for the Lord. And so, we shall all be changed on resurrection day. And in verse 52, he talks about that change and what's going to take place that day and the timing of that day. And he says, first definition here, he says, in a moment. And when it takes place, it's going to happen in a moment. In a moment. Uh, and then he adds that in the twinkling of an eye, and that's a short amount of time, and some of you already know what that is, at, at the last trump, the trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now, the dead being raised in, incorruptible, but I want to back up on this. Let's come back to the timing first. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and at the last trump. So we see those three things that are listed on that, on that day, all those three things. For the trump shall sound, and uh, another passage that comes to mind here is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and the voice of the archangel with the trump of God, and the dead shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord of the air, so we shall ever be with the Lord, be with the Lord. And so uh, the, the sound there, uh, the Lord himself shall descend with a shout. And so the trump could very well be referring to that very sound uh, that's referred to in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16 and 17. The trump shall sound. Uh, now, they have trumps in the scripture, so it certainly could be a trump there. Let's believe it is. But uh, there's a shout that's going to take place, and I think that's a, a trumpet-like sound. Then we which are alive and remain shall caught up together with them. And at first it says, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And the dead shall be raised incorruptible. Now, he's not talking about the lost dead. He's talking about the saved, isn't he? 
the saved are going to die in their sins. They're not going to be raised incorruptible, but the saints of God are going to be raised incorruptible. And uh, you say, well, where are the saints now? Well, uh, we believe that the saints are in that place called uh, the, uh, uh, the paradise portion of hell. That's what we believe. I got my papers all over the place. Now, if I start over, forgive me. I just got my papers back, back where they need to be here. And the living saints will be changed. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 52. And at that moment, the twinkling eye for the trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ shall be raised uh, incorruptible and we shall be changed. We shall be changed. What a change is going to take place in that day. And uh, we can uh, theorize about that change and uh, we can think about that change. But uh, I think the Lord knows what it's going to be, exactly how it's going to be. But this corruption must uh, have put on incorruption. So uh, what does that mean? Well, our body is corruptible. Our body is weak. Our body is uh, made of the flesh. It's not an eternal body. But when this body, uh, corruptible body, puts on incorruption, that's got to be a change in us physically, metaphorically, doesn't there? There's got to be a tre tre tremendous change that, that our bodies... Uh, 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 are, are changed there. And uh, so this corruptible must put on incorruption. And verse 53, this corruptible is put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be passed the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. And uh, that's exactly what it says there in, in those verses. And uh, we shall be changed. Uh, verse 54 says it like this. So when this corruptible is put on incorruption and moral put on immortality, that is brought to pass the saying, which is death is swallowed up in victory. And so on that day when this corruption uh, body is, is, uh, is, uh, uh, is put on incorruption, it's brought to pass the saying, death is swallowed up in victory. We're not going to die anymore. We're, we're going to be we're going to we're going to be eternal, as God has makes us so. Anybody looking forward to that? Uh, I am. I'm looking forward. That's all part of God's plan for us, and it's been His plan for many years. And this moral should put on immortality, and then it's brought to pass the saying, "Death is swallowed up in victory." And uh, then then uh, we may sing, "O death, where is thy sing?" Verse fifty five. O, o, o death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? And that's a wonderful song to sing. We can sing about that today, but it doesn't. We can't really sing about it till it really comes to pass. Now, the 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 reality is, is the way I look at it, uh, uh, is that when I minister to somebody, lead someone, and they see somebody Christ, their future is settled. Their future is settled. This is a song they are going to one day sing because they trusted in Jesus Christ, their personal Savior. And uh, while those things haven't come to pass yet, those things are going to come to pass and are as good as come to pass because it's right here in the book. It's, it's right here in the book. And uh, then that day we may sway, sing, Where is thy sing, O grave? Where is thy victory? Now I've gone through our songbook and I haven't found that there yet, but that's not to say it couldn't be there. Uh, certainly so associated with our salvation. And uh, that's a great song. Now the sting, what's that sting? The sting of death is sin. The sting of death is sin. And uh, uh, the sting of death is sin. Uh, and the strength of sin is the law. So the sting of, of sin of death is sin. And uh, uh, somebody, what do you mean the sting of death is sin? What do you mean by that? Well, I could say it. Uh, I could say it like the, the the bite of the of the of the uh, of the snake that bites you. The sting uh, that uh, of the of his bite is stings, but the wage of this of this thing is going to cause death. Now the reality is is that is that once we're saved, we're not going to die. And the sting of death is sin, and. Uh, and uh, we, we've been we given victory over the sting of death. We've been given victory over our sin. Where did we get our victory? Dick, where did we get our victory? Over sin? In, in Jesus Christ gave it to us when we trusted in him. He defeated sin and death. And when we believe in him, 
He imputes his victory to us. He, he calls us his children. We have the same victory. Dick is shaking his head. Yes, he likes that. For the sting of death and the strength of sin is the law. And uh, so the sting of death is sin. So that's the wage of sin. Is, is uh, death is sin. So the sting of death is sin. And then the strength of the, of the sin is the, is the law. And uh, now why does it say that? The law came from God. What's, the, what's wrong with the law? What does the law do? The law serves for one purpose. What is it? It's to condemn. Isn't that why the law comes? It, it comes to condemn. And, uh, uh, and uh, the Ten Commandments came and it showed that all men were sinners. That's what it proved. In need of a Savior. If, if you don't believe that, uh, study the Ten Commandments and uh, see if you could practice the Ten Commandments and what those Ten Commandments will do. If you really read them and really understand what they mean, it should convict you of your need of a Savior. It should convict you of your sinfulness. Now, I'll tell you something. One of the hardest things to do is to deal with lost people is to convict them that, that they're sinners in need of a Savior. Uh, we're living in an age right now that so many churches want to say, you're okay, I'm okay. Oh, friend, we're not okay. We're not okay. We're condemned to death because of our sinfulness. And churches that want to okay us and, feel, and cause us to believe that we don't have a problem with sin, they're no help to us at all, are they? No help to us at all. And for the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. And the law reinforces the fact that we're sinners, doesn't it? And no man is uh, justified by keeping the law, for no man's kept the law, have they? All the law comes is to convict us of sin, to show us that we're sinners. But thanks be to God, verse 57, and this is a, a thank you, thanks be to God, which giveth us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, so we're coming along here, and we see that we're all under the curse of sin. We're all going to die and go to a crisis eternity. But God sent his only begotten son to die for us on Calvary, didn't he? And uh, thanks be to God, which he uh, gives us victory over sin and death through what? Our Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus came to die for us, didn't he? Uh, uh, some would say, well, I think it's a terrible thing that they crucified him. I, I wish he would have uh, left him alone, let him live forever. Well, listen. Uh, he is our sin bearer. He didn't die for his sins. He died for our sins. Our sins. And if he was not crucified, if he didn't give his life for our sins, we'd be hopeless and helpless because we can't pay for our own sin. The only, listen, the only one that can pay for sin is a sinless one. Because if he's a sinner, then he's dying for his own sin. And so we had to have the sinless Messiah come to give his life for us. Praise God he did that, isn't it? That's a wonderful truth, isn't it? And, the, and uh, so where's our victory? Well, we find it in Jesus Christ. And uh, he became our sin bearer on Calvary. And he was buried. And, uh, and uh, when God was said three days, he rose again. Why? Because the Father was satisfied with the sacrifice for sin. And yet he had no sin. So whose sin did he die for? Our sin. Our sin. Thanks be to God which giveth us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 57. So we're to say thanks. We're to say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for giving us that victory. Are you glad? Are you thankful to him for giving you that victory? Amen. Amen. I, 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 and, and he, he's right. That's what we should do. We should be rejoicing, glad for what God has done through us, to us, for his, through his son. That's what Christ has given to us. We, we have, oh, we should be singing his praises right from the heart of hearts. We should be shouting it from a house time. And, uh, uh, and uh, I love the Easter time, and I love when they sing, He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives for me. Because that's a testimony that the Father was satisfied with the sacrifice of the Son for your sins and my sins. Hallelujah. 
He didn't just bear our sins. He bore our sins and carried them grave and rose uh, 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 sinless. Ooh, that's a wonderful truth. So thanks be to God which gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We must therefore then believe uh, 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 we must my beloved brethren be resolved look at verse 15 therefore and that's a, that's a good way of saying therefore to be resolved my beloved brethren be steadfast unmovable always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know your labor is not in vain now if we were going to preach just the three point sermon and I was going to get a little windy on it we could poke a park right on that one, one uh, verse right there because what's the exhortation my beloved brethren, we're all in the same boat here together. Uh, be ye steadfast. What does that mean? What does it mean to be steadfast? Well, I think in our relationship with the Lord, it means to be steadfast in our position right here. Don't go back to sin, amen? What, what, uh, what grieves the heart of the, of the individual uh, that's led you to the Lord if they find out you went back into sin. What must grieve the heart of our Savior who's died for us and God has forgiven for sin and then we weren't steadfast. But we all have a responsibility to be steadfast. We got to be steadfast in our position and we need to be unmovable. 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 Uh, uh, just out of curiosity, what would you think it would mean to be unmovable? What would that apply to? Anybody? Yes? Stay in the same place and don't go one way or the other. Unshakable. Mm -hmm. Unmovable. I would think of that would mean to be unshakable. And uh, we need to be unshakable in our belief of what Jesus Christ has done for us on Calvary. And so he uses those terms up. He says, be steadfast. Being, when I think of the word steadfastness, I think of being faithful. And I think unmovable means I'm not going to change. I'm not going to move from, uh, uh, he's the anchor for my soul. I'm not going to move from my belief in him as my sin bearer. And then the third one is powerful. Because the first two deal with doctrine. The, the third, I think, deals with the practical life that we live. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Now, now that's, that's, that's as important as the other ones, isn't it? It's an equal importance to being uh, steadfast. Okay, firm in the belief. I believe Jesus died for me on Calvary. I believe I'm saved by faith. That's steadfast in that. I believe that. That's good. And, and unmovable. I'm not going to shake from that. I'm going to believe that Jesus is and all the other. But what about this one? Always abounding in the work of the Lord. I, I got some sad news for you, and I know that Pastor Burroughs has had this as well. We've we've saw people that were sound in faith; they are they're saved. We don't doubt they're saved. We don't doubt that they're that they're unmovable from their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. But we sometimes find people that no longer, no longer, are abounding in the work of the Lord. They're not interested in serving anymore. They're not interested in in doing the work that God has called them to do. What is one of the chief works that God calls us to do? Anybody? Win souls. What's that? Yes, win souls. Great one. Reaching out to the lost and dying around us. Matter of fact, we don't have to go very far. We just need to go as far as our relatives. Our lost and, our lost and re, our relatives. And the ones we work with and the ones we talk to. And the ones that have just came into our life. The ones that have married into our life. Because they married your brother or your sister or whatever. And so, listen, therefore, we need to be steadfast. And I, he, I like the way Paul says this here. Therefore, my beloved brethren, he's speaking this in a loving tone, be steadfast, be unmovable, and always be abounding in your work for the Lord, and then your motivation. For as much as ye know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You know, uh, in that verse, the last phrase is the one that doesn't get the, the gets the least amount of attention. The least amount of attention. Your labor is not in vain in the Lord. When we're doing 
what we're supposed to be doing. It's not in vain. It's not it's not not for nothing. Vain means empty. It doesn't have a reason. It doesn't it has a reason, it has a purpose, and it will bear fruit. Things that are in vain bear no fruit. But listen, our labor, our efforts in the Lord need to go forward and they're not in vain in the Lord. Now we follow up with that exhortation here in verse 58. It goes on here. He says, Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Lord, your neighbor's not in vain. And I already spoke on this. We need to be unmovable. We need to be abounding in the work of the Lord. That's your duty. That's your, that's your duty. That's your work. And, and uh, we always need to be uh, our labor, diligent in our labor, and we always need to know that. We always need to know that. Do you know that about your Christian life? That just getting saved is just the beginning. It's not the end. Did you know that when you follow the Lord in believer's baptism, that's not the end. That's just another step in the beginning of your faithfulness and your duty. And Paul has one of these, all these wonderful things in 1 Corinthians 15. And I hope this little passage has been a blessing to you. I copied this out of a commentary I have at home. I'm not supposed to do that, by the way. It's, a, it's copyrighted, but I did it anyway. The promise in the prospects. And the reason I copied it, because it has a word in here that I think only, only my wife and... Uh, and perhaps Liz knows what it is, so I'll, I'll say, Liz, pay attention. Liz, listen up. The word is elucidation. Elucidation. Getting the L girls here. It's spelled E-L-U-C-I-D-A-T-I-O-N. You're saying, preacher, you read books that have got those kinds of words in it? Yeah, I borrowed them from Brother uh, No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had to read that and I thought oh my but here we go I show you a mystery we should not all sleep we should all be changed and of course the fellow wanted everything to end with a T-I-O-N so that's where the elucidation comes from he wanted it to end with uh, uh, a T-I-O-N or just as a T-I-O-N the elucidation I show you a mystery and that means it's a divine revelation to show the prospects. In other words, it's a revelation. And then the exception, we shall not all sleep in the exaltation, but we shall all be changed. And I come back to that because we can do what God has called us to do because we've been changed. We've been saved and we've been changed and we've been enabled. And when Christians say they can't do it, you can do it. He's changed you. He saved you. He made you into something called a new creature in Christ. And when Christians say they can't do what God has called them to do, listen, don't call God a liar. He will not call you to do something you can't do. We can do, we can do it. We can live the life that God has called us to do. But we got to have our wanter changed. One fellow said, the problem is not with uh, uh, what we want to do, uh, the, uh, not, not what we do, it's that the problem is what we want to do, and I think that's true sometimes. We need to make it our, our goal in life to take a passage like this and put it on your refrigerator or read it to yourself before you go to bed at night and say, Lord, today, I want to do all you've called me to do. I want to live up to the calling, your high calling. Remember this, God doesn't save us so we would remain in sin. God has remained us and set us free from sin. But God wants us to be a witness and a testimony to others that they could do it too. 1 Corinthians 15, I'm going to read that passage just to you again. Might be a passage you want to just uh, write it down and put and read on a regular basis because it's something that gives great hope to every blood-bought child of God. 
Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, the twinkling eye at the last trump uh, shall sound, and the dead and shall be raised incorrupt, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible uh, shall have put on immor incorruption, this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought past the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O victory, O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Everything we do for the Lord, in the Lord, is going to have a worthwhile purpose. I so appreciate uh, 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 some of the writings that Paul did, and and uh, 1 Corinthians 15 is called the Resurrection Chapter, and it's a it's a great it's a great chapter to read and to reread and to read and to reread, and it's a good chapter to to share with even the lost, because it really talks about the whole work of God, and it ends with these great exhortations to everyone that's everyone that's saved, and I pray it's been a blessing to you tonight. Let's pray. Father, thank you for yourself and your son. And I, I pray that uh, the uh, few words I've shared tonight have been a blessing uh, to your children. And I pray it exhorts us to, to, to live up to the high calling. And we were not saved uh, to stay in sin. We were saved to reach sinners for Christ, to be part of the great work of evangelism, that, that the great news, the good news of Jesus Christ would not just stop with us, but it would go out from us to others that we could encourage others to live up to your high calling. And Lord, as we might encourage each other here tonight, that we might pray for one another, that we might be the children of God you've called us to be, that we might be the witnesses you've called us to be, that we might be the children of God you've called us to be. Bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.